Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Amar Sali. I'm a consultant physician and nephrologist working with the Sri Hindu Mandal Hospital in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to Series 130 of the Africa Healthcare Network Fireside Chats. We are excited to be presenting a set of research webinars in preparation for the International Pediatric Nephrology Association 2025 Congress in Cape Town, South Africa, and are grateful to the IPNA to be teaming up with the Africa Healthcare Network Fire platform. These research webinars will assist early researchers and those interested to understand important aspects of the conduct of a clinical trial. Moderating the session tonight, we will have Professor Hesham Safu, who is the Professor of Pediatrics and Pediatric Nephrology in the Faculty of Medicine in Cairo University, Egypt. He is also the current president of the African Pediatric Nephrology Association and a member of the International Pediatric Nephrology Association Executive Board. With him, we have Dr. Ashton Quetze, who is a pediatric nephrologist currently based at the Red Cross Children's Hospital in Cape Town and a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town. So, Professor Hesham and uh, Dr. Ashton, you're welcome to start off the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Omar, for your uh, present, uh, kind introduction. Uh, of course, it's my pleasure to introduce, you know, my uh, model <laughs> and previous uh, head of the uh, African Pediatric Nephrology Association, Professor Mignon McCulloch, she needs no introduction. She's known by everybody in Africa and African pediatric nephrology. She is a professor and head uh, of pediatric nephrology and solid organ transplantation at the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital uh, in Cape Town. And uh, she is president of the South African Transplantation Society and press pres past president of the International Pediatric Transplantation uh, Society or association, I think, and uh, we look forward to a great meeting. And um, uh, actually, uh, Professor Mignon is doing a fantastic uh, job with her uh, team in South Africa in uh, getting us uh, ready for this um, uh, um, interesting and um, very important Congress that we are very proud to have on Africa uh, at last, you know, to represent IPNA. So please go ahead, Mignon. Thank you. Thank you, Hesham, for a very kind introduction. Uh, no pressure, as they'd say in the classics. Um, and just want to say thank you to everybody on this call for running with this idea. Uh, most importantly, to Ashton Kutsia for running with this thinking, uh, getting everyone together. Thanks to uh, Valerie and Rulan, who you're going to be hearing speaking. Hesham is always the, the big boss. And then just a big thanks to Lloyd and Amar for letting us hijack this platform. So why are we doing this? Because we've got uh, IPNA 2025 in Cape Town. Um, it's never been in Africa before. We know that Africa has a huge burden of diseases, lots of nephrology problems. Um, half the countries are English speaking, the other half are French. Um, we, as you can see on this map, since 1969, it's been held all over the world, but the first time ever that it's going to be held in Africa. So really proud of that fact. Um, these are the dates. It's the 20th EPNA Congress and it will be early in the year. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, this is our organizing committee. Um, we've got uh, lots of EPNA counselors are part of our group. We've got three scientific chairs, uh, Rukshana Shroff, Pierre Cochard representing the French community and Stephen Marx, and then part of our local bid committee, uh, Peter Norse, Errol Gottlich, and Ashton as our young pediatric nephrology lead. Um, the important thing for me to share with you tonight is that the Congress is not a September-October Congress like it usually is. This is an early-in-the-year Congress, and what that means is that we actually need to start thinking research now. Ideally, we need to get our research in pretty quickly because the abstract closing will be mid-May next year, so we're not very far away from that. We'll let you know about abstract acceptance by July because we know that many people will need at least six months to get visas. Um, a lot of the fellows have actually asked us to really be timeless about that. And December, January is a little bit like July, August in the Northern Hemisphere in that we all go to the beach and we all have a holiday. And so getting anything done during that time is going to be difficult. So uh, this is slightly different thinking. So we've actually rebranded and we've called it an early year Congress because everybody is used to IPNA being at the end of the year. And I'm just really excited about getting everybody involved with research. A lot of 
fellows are going to be on part of this call. We want you to come and come with your ideas, case studies, research, and just really grateful um, to Valerie and Rulan for helping us put together some research. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. And over to the rest of you. Um, so in the lead up to IPNA 2025, uh, we put together a research webinar series. And like Minya said, uh, the goal is really to encourage junior researchers in Africa to get good quality research together um, so that they can submit abstracts for IPNA 2025 so that we can really maximize the amount of African candidates and African presenters at our conference. Um, thanks once again to, to Lloyd um, for really allowing us to use this platform. Um, so uh, we brought together a couple of topics um, and the idea really is to take you through the process of um, drawing up a research paper, thinking about topics, and then going through the process of collecting data, reviewing that data, and preparing the paper and the abstract and the submission process. Um, once again, thanks to Valerie and Rulan, who are really taking the lead in this. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Prof. Rulan Parekh. Uh, she is a, a senior um, academic at the University of Toronto um, and a senior physician at uh, Sick Kids in Toronto. She's also quite extensively um, involved in research, especially involved in longitudinal studies looking at um, the long term prospects of in adrenal disease as well as transplant uh, patients. Over to you, Roland. Thanks so much, Ashton. Um, hi, everyone, and it's so great to see so many people online. Um, I'm here really just to say that, you know, there's been a lot of work that's happened, I think, on the continent in the last decade. And it's always been a pleasure and a privilege to work within Africa. In the H3 Africa Kidney Disease Research Network, um, a huge amount of work has happened over the last decade where almost 10,000 participants have been recruited. And that really could not have happened without all of you um, and with all the work that you've done and all the stellar um, efforts that you put forward thinking that research is important. And that's really an important thing to do in order to help your communities and the, and the patients that you serve. And what is really important is that out of that group of the 10,000, there's almost a over, there's almost a thousand children that have been recruited in many centers and we continue to grow that. And I think what's amazing is that um, there's so much potential work that I've seen with different projects that people have been doing. And I'm always amazed at, at what can be done within Africa. And so even though I know sometimes it's overwhelming with the clinical work, and that it's hard to, to do. The hope is that we can give you some structure over the next few weeks that can help you and sort of encourage you to do some of these research projects. I think what's really important is that you've got lots of local expertise and you have lots of local need to understand the epidemiology, to understand the outcomes, to understand how best you can serve the patients that you take care of. And it doesn't necessarily need to be what we might do in North America or what we might do in Europe but we need to really think about problems that are being fixed um, by African physicians for African patients and really coming up with local solutions that you think can fix it. And so I, I really look forward to helping people work on their projects and think of creative ideas with solutions that they want to test and see how that could work and perhaps think about what questions they could ask in order to improve patient outcomes. And so my hope is with this huge number of almost 70 participants now on the call, I'm really looking forward to seeing the ideas that you may have that you want to actually put forward. And so I can see how we can help you. And um, when people talk about doing projects with Africa, how difficult it is, it is difficult. But what I've seen um, resoundingly is enthusiasm to make sure that you can have impact and make a difference. And so I really look forward to, to this program and getting ready to make a difference with IPNA in 2025 that hopefully we can have all of you presenting and all of you showcasing all the great work that you're doing across the continent. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rulan. Thank you. And uh, now I think uh, we uh, should move on to our uh, main uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Val Valerie L Lux from, uh, she, uh, <laughs> she is um, uh, the um, associate lecturer. She is now the, a nephrologist at the Children's Hospital in Zurich and um, I have a, a bit of difficulty in pronouncing this uh, German name in Canton Spital Graubünden uh, in Chur in Switzerland. And I think she was a previously an associate lecturer in the renal division of Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School and uh, honorary associate professor in pediatrics and children's health at the University of Cape Town. 
Deputy Chair, Advocacy Working Group, International Society of Nephrology, American Board Certified in Internal Medicine and Nephrology, and she has an MSD in Public Health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She has a PhD in Biomedical Ethics from the University of Zurich, and Professor Valerie will be speaking about scientific reading and critical literature reviews. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just share my screen quickly. Um, um, so thank you. I know my affiliations are a little bit uh, complicated. They change quite a bit. <laughs> but um, I am originally from South Africa, an adult nephrologist. I have some experience in pediatric nephrology. And I think one message here as well is that um, given that we've been also given the privilege of joining this Africa Fireside Network um, sort of webinar series, that the African, the adult nephrologists, I see several of them on the call can um, also participate and you never know, you could also possibly submit some abstracts. If not to IPNA, there's always the WCN, et cetera. But I do think as well that in Africa, there's this opportunity to bring adults and children together that are not really brought together in much of the rest of the world, since many of you are actually looking after both. And so I really feel that there is a huge amount of potential as Rulan said. So I've been given the honor and a little bit the daunting task of trying to kick this off. And so the talk today is a little bit general. It's not really specific. It's not enormously going to be giving you tools necessarily, but I just to set the scene a little bit about um, the importance of research and also the importance of planning and preparing research. So um, without any further ado, the overview of what I'll be discussing today is a little bit uh, basic about what is the literature, where is the literature, why should one search the literature, how do we search the literature, and then a little bit at the end about systematic literature search, which is really a form of uh, research itself. So I just wanted to share with you uh, first a little case. Uh, this was a patient that I had when I was on call uh, sort of about probably two years ago now, fairly early in, in COVID. 30-year-old male who had end-stage kidney disease was otherwise a very healthy patient and waiting for a kidney transplant, but he developed COVID and was extremely hypoxic and he was not doing a, a, a well at all. And I came on on the weekend and I saw this gentleman and, and all my colleagues were saying, we can't give remdesivir because it's not possible to give it with a glomerular filtration rate below 30. Uh, and at that time, remdesivir was really being used a little bit um, experimentally, but there was some idea that it might work. And so I really thought to myself, I can't just watch this gentleman die of this. So I did a little bit of a literature search, literally put in kidney disease, remdesivir, COVID, et cetera. And I came up with this paper that had just been published from India. And interestingly, they had been able very rapidly to collect 46 patients many of whom actually required dialysis, had severe renal dysfunction, and most of them actually responded well, survived. And so I was able to take this paper, which had been published from a cohort in India, to the head of the hospital here in Switzerland, and managed to convince them with a small case series that it was worth giving our patient a try. They ordered remdesivir, which was not on stock in the hospital, and within two days, this gentleman was off oxygen and eventually fully recovered. So this really, to me, just shows, first of all, obviously, I was able to find this only because I could do a literature search, but what I think is more important as a message for today is that it's important to do studies and it's important to share what you do. And at that point, obviously, this new medication, nobody in the nor global north would have had 46 patients to put on this drug so rapidly. So really, I think there's a lot of power that we have in places where we are busy. And I really think that um, publications are important. So we need to share our data. And this is, to me, really the whole purpose of this webinar series, to give people the ideas, the confidence, the sharing of ideas to really stimulate good submissions to the IFNA conference and then hopefully also publications. So now just briefly, what is the literature? So you all know this, I'm sure you're all using it every day, but it's really just a published collection of written knowledge. It's not necessarily magic. I think what we have to realize is we ourselves are all contributors to this literature. The medical literature obviously can um, covers a broad range of topics. It's very often comes from academic work, but sometimes it's from NGOs, from the WHO, for example, from um, organizations that publish 
um, brochures or collections of work. It's most often articles, but can be books, reports, dissertations. And ideally, if it's really going to be high quality, it should be peer reviewed because none of us is perfect in what we write and we can always get benefit from people reviewing what we do. And ideally as well, it should come from reputable sources. So a lot of people get their information from the newspaper and this is definitely not literature. And this hits obviously the front pages when Donald Trump took hydroxychloroquine and was feeling absolutely great, but this is obviously not a good study and not literature. So where do we find the real literature? So obviously in the past we had libraries, we'd go to books. Now we still have some libraries, but we have the benefit of having databases that we can all access as we sit on our telephones in the traffic or we sit in our offices and the databases that we generally tend to use in medicine are PubMed, Web of Science, et cetera. There's also gray literature, which is really literature that is also very worthwhile, but it's not necessarily indexed in PubMed, for example, and this might be various publications by the WHO, for example, or by other certain organizations where they might have pulled together a lot of academics and written really excellent reports, but you won't find those if you look on PubMed. So this is where sometimes if you go to Google Scholar or Google, you might actually identify more of these gray literature. And then books, a lot of social scientists tend to write books rather than papers. So sometimes one has to trawl one's, one's way through a book on a specific topic. And another extremely important place where we can find literature pointing us in the right direction is in bibliographies of papers that we have come across that are relevant to the question that we're thinking about. So why do we search the literature? So I just showed you that as a clinician, obviously we search, but I think even as a researcher, and a lot of us are clinical researchers, so we might have a clinical problem and we want to try to explain it or understand it or develop a solution. So really going back to the literature, you try to first of all find a little bit of background for yourself. You try to understand the problem better. You try to understand what's been done, what's known, what may not be known. And so if one is wanting to start a study, for example, um, I know that in Ghana, there seems to be a lot of chronic kidney disease related to possibly heavy metal exposure. That's a question one comes up with in the, in the clinic. One needs to go back and look this up, and then maybe one can actually plan a study. And then finally, there is this third form of literature review, which is really a form of research itself, which is a systematic review. So I will be discussing uh, that as well a little bit later. So a literature review, really, if you sit down and decide, okay, I want to try to look up a certain problem, try to understand a certain problem, you have to have a little bit of a hypothesis. What do you want to look up about that problem? You need um, the information that you find can help you to form background for a particular study and help you then later on to possibly even interpret your own data. Sometimes we do literature searches to look for methods. Sometimes we do searches to look for ways other people might have analyzed certain data. We try also to do literature searches to keep ourselves up to date. And what I would suggest, if you have a specific interest and are thinking about doing a specific uh, study, when you do a literature search, just try to keep your references that you find in a reference manager, and we'll discuss some of these a little bit later, because then you have your own little library where you can then easily go back and find these, and then also use them, obviously, if you want to write. So if we think we want to do a literature review. If we want to do one just for ourselves as a little preamble to thinking about a study, the first thing we need to do is formulate the problem, develop the question. We then go and look at the literature. Once we actually find what we think we're looking for in the literature, we need to evaluate what we find. And so if we find various papers, we need to decide is their content relevant, relevant to us. And you also, when you start digging deeper into the pa papers, you need to think what about the quality of what I'm finding? Is this something I can really believe and I can use? And then you might want to actually analyze your own data relative to that data or analyze the data you found per se. And then ultimately you want to pull everything that you've read together and interpret your data um, in the context of what's already known, what already been published, and that will then help you to really formulate your research question and possibly even your writing up your research results. So the value of a literature review, this might be a little bit repetitive, is really to contextualize the problem that you're looking for looking or thinking about with the work that's already been done. You don't want to repeat a study that was just done next week. But if your context is very, very different, just because someone did a study in Paris doesn't mean you can't do a study in Dakar.
often you might bring a new interpretation to something if you've made specific observations. So your study may still be very well um, worthwhile doing. Sometimes there's contradictory data. And so one does actually need more studies. And often the more studies one has, the better to understand a problem properly. Plus, if one looks at the literature, one might really realize there's a big gap. And in Africa, there are a lot of gaps. Just the other day, I was discussing with uh, Elliot Tanner, for example, about the SGLT2 inhibitors. And he was mentioning there are no studies in Africa. So do we really know that these medicines work in Africa? Very likely, yes, but it would be great to have a study to show us that. And then also, it, if you do a good literature review, you also will understand where your work will fit or where it already fits in the context of the existing literature. So now I'll just go a little bit more onto a systematic literature review, which is a form of research in itself. I'm using this though also as a framework because I think the simple, the rules that do apply to systematic review should also guide a little bit how we even do informal literature reviews for ourselves if we're planning a study. So the systematic literature review is really a, a method, and this needs to be an unbiased literature review. The aim is to identify all relevant items related to a specific topic. It should be transparent and reproducible. So if you look at the methods of a systematic review, if you use those, you should be able to come up with the same literature search that the researchers are reporting on. When you want to do a systematic literature review, you have to have a study team. It's not enough to just be one person because of this unbiased requirement. If you do a search and find 500 papers, in theory, two people should sort through that list and both agree which are the relevant papers that meet um, inclusion or exclusion criteria to be considered or not for the review. And then later on, when you come to the extraction of the data and consideration of actually full text papers in this process, again, at least two people should be double checking what each other are doing. And so here it's very, very important to adhere to the correct methodology, because if you want to publish a systematic review, if you haven't adhered to the right methodology, uh, the the journals will very likely not accept the paper. So this is just one example of a flow sheet. Uh, this particular example comes from 2014 on all the different steps involved in a systematic review. I don't expect you to look to read this in detail now. We're going to go through that. But the steps are really preparation, which should be the same for most studies, then retrieval of the work, appraisal of the studies, synthesis of what you found, and then writing things up. So to begin with, in the preparation stage for a systematic review or for any study, you need to really decide what is the research question. In this case of the review, but otherwise, what is your research question? What literature do I want to look for? An easy way to start is actually look for systematic reviews that are already on the topic you're looking for. Because if you find a recent one that was comprehensive and very well done, it often gives you a shortcut, especially if you're looking for background for, a, for your own uh, research or clinical study, for example. Sometimes if an excellent systematic review has just been done on the topic, you may have to say, okay, fine, it's been done. I shouldn't repeat the same one. You might need to think of something different. If you also find some very good systematic reviews, but there might be multiple and they haven't all included the same studies, those bibliographies are also very helpful. And then what you need to do is try to develop your own objective reproducible sound methodology. So the search terms and the search method needs to be reproducible. And for that, you need to decide which databases do I want to search. And then you need to develop keywords that you're going to enter into this database to try to find all the trials that might be relevant to your search. So places to look for systematic reviews are places like the Cochrane Library. Here is the website. Um, you can literally just type in the topic and you will see whether or not there have been recent Cochrane uh, reviews. These reviews are usually very extensive and can be very good sources of literature and support, whether you're planning a systematic review or another study. More on the social sciences side is this Campbell collaboration. Again, here you can look and find um, many reviews here. They say about a policy relevance and social science. And then what's extremely important if you're planning a systematic re review, there is this Prospero website, and many journals actually require you to register your systematic review before you even start 
on this website. Part of the reason there is that there is a collective uh, oversight of what systematic reviews are being done, because unfortunately you don't know if something hasn't been published yet, but you might find on this website that someone is doing exactly what you're planning, in which case, again, you may not want to do it. You have to apply for the Prospero registration. They also look and see that there's not going to be duplication. You will probably have seen that some authors actually then publish their systematic review protocol and their methods before they even start. It's kind of a way of putting a stake in the sand to say, I'm doing this review. But the important thing with this Prospero process is you have to register before you even start really doing your systematic review. So because otherwise, you can't register. They ask you really to say before you've really entered any search terms, you need to register. And so sometimes there's a delay in the registration, but I think as soon as you've actually applied for the registration, then you can really start with your review. If you've already gotten halfway, you're not really allowed unless you're un not, not being honest to really register the Prospero in retrospect. So I really advise that you do this before you even start, it is free. Uh, so then you're really sticking to all the criteria and the chances are your study will be good and you can get published. And here the website really takes you through how to register. So if when, when we're thinking now of starting a review, we need to think what keywords and what questions are we going to try to answer and what are we going to put into our databases in order to find what we're looking for. So here is an example. This is called the PICO questions. I think some of you have probably come across this. These are mostly used if there's an intervention study and the P, I, and C, and O all stand for things. So the P stands for patient population or problem. And so it's basically, you have to think, how would I describe the patient population I want to include in the studies that are found? What problems? So for example, patients with HIV who are being treated for malaria, uh, you might want to include um, those as your patient population, for example. Then the intervention might be what intervention is being studied in this population. So you might have a specific idea. I want to use a certain antiretroviral drug or a certain anti-malaria drug and see if it's going to work. Then you need to have a comparison. So what would be the alternatives that you need to also think about? because you want to include the comparison. If you're really going to do a systematic review and then subsequently possibly add on a meta-analysis, you might want, you're going to want to know how to evaluate the value of your intervention. So you need to know what the comparison is. And then you obviously have to have an outcome. So are you going to look for mortality? Are you going to look for hospitalization? Are you going to look for survive, for um, acute kidney injury episodes, etc.? So this is just a little smattering of examples. But um, if you use the systematic piece questions before you start your, your literature search, it will help you to really refine what are your questions, what are you really trying to answer, because if you are more specific with your search terms, you're less likely to get a lot of noise in your search. So we've mentioned that search terms are very important. You need to identify keywords and phrases, so they don't have to be only words. So it might be kidney transplantation in sub-Saharan Africa in children, for example, could all be keywords and phrases. You then need to determine inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria. Very often people say only in English or other languages. Uh, you want to decide adults or children. You want to decide where these studies should come from. And then exclusion criteria will be what's not your inclusion criteria, but all of these things need to be decided up front. So once you've decided your keywords, you can put them into uh, the database. And so the aim here is to be relatively broad with your keywords, but quite specific. Um, I can't really give you all the keys for this today. You may have to there are some tools where you can get some some advice about developing keywords, but the aim is really at the beginning to spread your net as widely as possible to find all the relevant citations. So you will also find irrelevant ones. You can very easily, if you import your citations all into a, a, a data management like EndNote or Mendeley, you can very rapidly get rid of identical duplicate citations. And then there are various, um, various different uh, search engines that you can use. So often in a systematic review, you'll have to use more than one. I think if you're really sitting at your desk trying to answer questions about planning a study, it's probably quite fine to go into PubMed. Google Scholar, as I mentioned, sometimes finds things that PubMed doesn't. There are other databases um, available. There are certain knowledge maps that might help you to structure a literature review if that's really your plan. 
Sometimes there's help also with writing. There I'd be a little bit cautious. And then, as I mentioned, the citation um, tools are extremely important. If you can import directly from your search into, for example, Zotero and Mendeley are free. Many people use EndNote. I myself happen to use EndNote for many, many years. Um, but this is an example here, for example, this table was made by this person here, this Dr. Asad Navid, who's on Twitter, and he actually has quite a lot of tools and tips about systematic reviews on his Twitter, so you could decide to follow him. But the point is, with these citation tools, while you're doing your search, download all the papers, even if it's too many, so then you can actually use these citation tools to actually help you to sort through what you found. Other places where we might want to find literature, because as we know, some African journals, for example, might not show up on PubMed. There is an African Index Medicus. And then if you go to the WHO website, uh, which I've put here, there's actually access to various other databases where you can find African specific studies. And then the WHO also has this Hinari um, program where people can actually get full texts from low and middle income countries under certain circumstances. So I would add always a search for these African databases because you may not find these in the mainstream databases all the time. And then if we want to now do a search, I've just used PubMed here, and let's say I put in very broad search terms, kidney transplantation in Africa, you will see even if I look at the top two papers, these are not exactly what I was looking for. This first paper is looking more at dialysis from Ethiopia, and the word transplant showed up in the abstract, so PubMed found that. And then the second paper actually has nothing to do with uh, Africa and is actually North America, but if you look at it, the author's name is Africa. So you can understand that with very broad search terms, you will find an enormous amount of papers. In this case, 977, which one would have to wade through. So in general, it's a little bit better to try to be a little bit more specific. And so here you can actually click on this tab saying advanced in PubMed. It takes you to another screen and here you can add various terms. So I have added already kidney transplantation and then I can say add or or and here you can add various other ways you might want to also find patients with kidney failure renal failure etc here often if you have different terms for the same thing you might want to put or 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 then you can click on and for example and if you don't want the whole of africa you might want to put specific countries or all the countries individually in sub-saharan africa and so this will help you then eventually to refine your search it's difficult for me to explain i just suggest that you do trial and error and try other times you might know a specific author who's actually working on a certain topic that you might be interested in. So here, for example, I've taken Professor Bamboya from Nigeria and put transplant. And here I came across a recent paper that he contributed to with others from Africa um, on transplantation. And here I can see, great, this is really answering what, I, what I'm interested in, but unfortunately this is not open access. So either I myself am lucky, I can go through my library, but uh, sometimes it's not really possible. So we'll discuss how we might be able to get hold of these uh, open access papers in a moment. But what I wanted also to mention here is how do we get this into the citation manager, into EndNote or Mendeley or Zotero? So in PubMed, there's this option saying send to. You then can click, the little menu comes down, you can click on citation manager. And it will go, you'll come to another uh, another window that says create file. You click on create file and then automatically the citation is in your library. So for me, as I said, I use EndNote, but many of you can use others. And I, I know that there are these ways of doing direct importations. One caveat for me that took me a while to learn is that with the Mac, I need to use Firefox and not Safari. Otherwise, this connection doesn't work. And so you may again have to troubleshoot yourself whatever your computer system is, your search engine is, and whatever you're working to make this work. But there definitely are ways that all these searches can be directly downloaded. So once we've downloaded our search and we've, we've found a list of, uh, of basically potential studies in, in PubMed, we need to screen all these abstracts. And very often here, for example, if you're looking for kidney transplantation and you see an abstract is talking about liver transplantation, that you can then very quickly just get rid of that. 
Whereas if you think it is kidney transplantation in Nairobi, for example, then you say, yes, this paper I want to keep, I definitely want to obtain a full text. So then you, and even that Ethiopian study on dialysis where they mentioned not, no access to transplant, you may want to obtain a full text of that as well, just to try to make sure you're not missing something. And then once you've decided you want to look at the full text, then you need to try to screen the whole article. And as I mentioned, sometimes this is a little bit problematic. And sometimes if you can't get open access uh, copies or your library doesn't have it, I'd just like to remind people that you can request copies directly from the authors. So here again, I come back to the same paper. And here you can see in PubMed, there is also the author affiliations. And if you want to look at all these one, two, three, where these people come from, you can click expand. And some journals, unfortunately not all, just on this PubMed front page, without even trying to look for the article, there is the email of the corresponding author. And very often, if you email this person sort of with some positive comments about their wonderful paper that you want to read, very almost always people have sent me a PDF when I've connected this way. So there are ways to get these PDFs, even if your library may not have it and it may not be open access. And then what I mentioned before, you look at the papers, you might retrieve the papers, you might read the whole paper. And again, if you have certain papers that you really think are making great points, look at their bibliography, because in their bibliography, you might find new citations, then you go back to this uh, process of adding that to your uh, list of papers that you then want to try to review in full text. The issue here is that you could go on and on in circles forever. So once you start recognizing that the same articles are coming up in the bibliographies or papers that you've already seen, then you kind of know you've probably saturated your search. You've probably reached a point at which you've probably found pretty much most of the important papers. And then you can really stop and say, okay, now I want to go into the reading and in depth now into this data extraction and analysis. So then you come really to the synthesis phase of the systematic review, or if you're just, again, looking for things to inform your own research, you still want to make sure you've found whatever you could before you really start scratching your head about how you can plan your own study. So here in the systematic review, if you've downloaded all the full texts, you then decide which of these fulfill the exclusion and inclusion criteria. You may land up with even 30, 40, 50 papers that, in that fulfill your inclusion criteria. Then you need to go through this methodical process, and ideally two of you, to read all these 50 papers and extract the data. I usually use Excel, make columns for every little piece of information that I want to collect, and usually try to collect more than and less out of these papers otherwise you have to keep going back and getting extra extra uh, information so you want to extract the data once you've got all the data from your studies and the two of you have decided that you've collected all the relevant data that you're interested in you can then start on the synthesis process trying to put the data together try to draw pools conclusions from the data you might want to recheck the literature if you realize that um, it's been a little while since you conducted your search there might be some new things that have come up and then in some cases, the data might actually lend itself to a meta-analysis that this is a totally different kettle of fish. Um, and and in, in not all the data that one, one collects is always amenable to meta-analysis. And this I will not be discussing today. But I really am just trying to explain that you, you need to collect the papers, you need to read them, and then you need to go through them very thoroughly. Also, even if it's just to, to inform your own research that you really know what other people did. What's very critical, however, when you do decide to read all these papers, you need to be very critical about making sure what is the paper quality. Is this really something I should listen to? I can believe. Um, and so there are various questions you might want to ask yourself. Sometimes we just presume that a study is of quality because a famous person has written it. I would caution you to think, yes, it's very likely it's good, but not necessarily always. And on the other side, if someone you don't recognize has written it, it doesn't mean it's bad. So look at who wrote the study, look at where it was done. It might be 
really a, a study that hasn't hit PubMed but has been done in a neighboring country that is really similar to yours, in which case you really want to know what have they done. You want to look at the study and decide, has it been well done? Have they looked after bias? Have they looked after confounding? Have they been very transparent in how they've reported the data? Have you understood what they've actually done? And then have they been objective in interpreting their own data? Are they trying to oversell it? Are they balanced in their arguments? Are they believable in their arguments? And then you've got to ask yourself, is the study really adding value? Is this bringing new knowledge? Is this helping me to understand the problem better? Or is it going to help me to strengthen sort of sharing the knowledge through a systematic review? And there are actually also formal ways to check quality once you have collected data, especially if you want to do a systematic review. This is just one example. It's a website um, called CAST, which is in the United Kingdom. Again, the website is at the bottom here. And here is a list of all the various checklists that they have. And again, many journals will actually insist that you have used checklists to assess the quality of any studies that you include. Um, and this is just an example of the first two questions in this uh, randomized control trial checklist. So they ask, is the study clearly focused and did they assign participants in a randomized fashion, etc. So there are a lot of questions that need to be asked and each of each study you've identified, you would go through a checklist one for each study. And this is then important because when you report your data, you need to say, you know, most of the studies were high quality or sometimes all the studies were low quality, but you can argue still with the journal and with the reviewers that these were the only studies available. And so this is as good as it gets. But it is important that one goes through this rigorous process of assessing study quality, because sometimes you might actually exclude studies if the quality is not good. Another thing that I think might we need to think about when we're thinking about the quality of the study or how believable the study might be is I look at the conflict of interest statement and increasingly these are becoming almost as long as the paper itself. And this is an example from a recently high profile dialysis uh, trial published, I think at New England or, or Lancet. And you can see here how many conflicts of interest these few authors had. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm not saying these conflicts are necessarily changing the way they've written the study or conducted the study, but it's a little bit like a used car sign on a car that's for sale is that you, you've got to just think, you know, how would these people have maybe flavored their interpretation of their data because of all these conflicts of interest? This is why these conflicts are, are uh, reported. And it's not just the fact that you report your conflict of interest that it has no consequence. This is really a buyer beware almost statement. I do believe most of our colleagues are trying to be careful that they're not bringing these conflicts in, but this can be something important. If all the studies are pharma supported, then, for example, that is not necessarily the highest quality data when we're looking at the utility of a certain new intervention, for example. Then we need to remind ourselves in COVID, we really were like overwhelmed with studies. And here, basically, this really just showed us how perverse this academic system is, that it's sort of this publish or perish. And we need to try to guard against that. I think we really need to focus on publishing good quality, even if it sometimes takes a little bit longer. If we've done it really rigorously, we should always find a place to publish. But again, this publish or perish is why sometimes there is not good quality data out there and may not even be by good teams. The two fraudulent papers in COVID were by excellent sort of Harvard and even my own university. So we've got to be very, very careful when we're reading the literature. And then I, once we've done our systematic review, we've done our analysis, we need to think about writing it up. And my message here is persevere. Initially, for example, a lot of, and as we just heard from Ruland, Ruland, there's more and more excellent work coming out of Africa. 20 years ago, people were just presuming that nothing good could really come out. So these are just two examples. I tried to publish a paper on traditional remedies, and I published in the Central African Journal of, Medi um, Journal of Medicine. I was very grateful and proud to publish this paper there. But unfortunately, probably not many people have seen it, whereas we all know that if we manage to have luck and perseverance to try to publish in places like Lancet Global Health, a, a few more people will probably come across it. So it is ideal if we can publish in places that at least, as journals that at least are on PubMed, but hopefully if we do publish in these African journals, we can then increase their impact factors and 
increase the likelihood they will also get onto PubMed. There's absolutely nothing wrong with publishing in an African uh, journal. My only concern really is the visibility, but if it's open access, you can tweet about it, put it on LinkedIn, and you can publicize it yourself. So that's also a good place to publish. And also if you think the right people, the people you're interested in might actually see it there. And then finally, just this idea of predatory journals, because um, unfortunately with um, a lot of African authors don't even think of trying to publish in the mainstream journals because of the enormous costs and uh, the judgments that come with things. But unfortunately, there are a lot of predatory journals, and this is just a tiny warning. You get a lot of messages in your inbox saying, please publish with us, but several of them will actually hit you with a fee at the end. So just be very careful. Your, your uh, research is worthwhile, and so there is always a way to publish it. And so finally, now just in conclusion, this is my last slide. It's been a little bit of a whirlwind uh, tour, but just again, if you want to do any literature review, even for yourself, just trying to plan what can I do, what's known in a little study I want to do, or a big study I want to do, or do I want to do a proper systematic uh, review of the literature? You need to define the study question, develop a set of keywords and search terms, think about inclusion exclusion criteria, do the search, uh, identify databases where you want to do the search, do your search, identify the studies you want to include, make sure that there are good quality studies, extract the data, synthesize the data, write it up, and then hopefully publish. And I think this is what this webinar series is going to hopefully help you to do in various ways. And several of us are willing to try to help you and be backups and answer questions throughout the process, not only on these webinars, if you do need um, any advice or want to brainstorm with us. So here are just a couple of useful references, if this is helpful for any of you. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um... Thank you so much, uh, Professor Valerie, for this amazing talk and uh, for really encouraging uh, researchers and, uh, I mean, pediatric nephrologists or other uh, attendees of this uh, excellent webinar to do such advanced, you know, uh, literature uh, <clears throat> uh, and writing of articles because I think that systematic reviews are very, very limited from our continent. And uh, you've shown a couple of, of, of systematic views, and I think th th there are several difficulties, you know, and I, I wonder that um, I hope that these talks, you know, will help us to solve the problems that uh, we, uh, we we meet. You know, for example, uh, how, how, we can, how we in Africa can cooperate with more um, experienced um, uh, authors and researchers, for example, in... Uh, Europe or in the United States or other uh, uh, advanced uh, countries, so to say, to help us in doing a systematic review from Africa, for example, because this is, I, I think, uh, a, a daunting task and uh, many African um, physicians or authors don't have the, you know, the, the experience with how to do advanced statistics and analyses of data and so on. So this is really the highest level of research, of, 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 uh, of literature that one can write and I hope that we can, you know, um, cooperate in achieving such uh, a great task. Well, thank you. I think that is a very, very good point. Just to say, you know, I myself am not a major statistics person, so I always need help. But several of us a couple of years ago just decided we wanted to try to do systematic reviews from Africa on outcomes on acute kidney injury. And Professor Olowu, who's a pediatric nephrologist from Nigeria, was the first author together with Abdul Niang. They were co-first authors on that paper. And then Professor Gloria Ashuntantang was the first author on the end-stage kidney disease paper. And that was exactly what you were saying. We submitted these papers and they said, well, you know, they're all low quality just because a lot were small case series done from small hospitals without really control groups. There were just people retrospectively going through the files that they found in their hospital. But we managed to argue that this is as good as the literature was at that time. And we bo got both of them published amazingly and for free in the Lancet Global Health. It just took a lot of emails and a lot of pushing, but I'm sure several people on this on this call might might be co-authors. And I mean, it's, it was a wonderful collaboration. It was possible 
And at mm -hmm. that stage even, but we had to really dig around in all these African databases because we couldn't find the papers anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I think absolutely it's possible. I think one needs to persevere. I think one needs to believe one can do it. And I think that's exactly why I find this webinar series so great. And I just hope, you know, my feeling is I definitely can't necessarily help everybody with everything because I just don't have skills. But we might know people who are who have specific skills who are able to help. So yes. I think Rula and me, Minyan, all a lot of people also on this call might be willing to to contribute and offer guidance because I think there is so much clinical information, so much clinical expertise. Um, one sees all these amazing cases that people are discussing on Twitter. The rest of the world needs to learn about this. And also the Africans have kept the clinical acumen that everyone else is stopping examining the patient. You know, so there's just so much richness. And I really believe, um, you know, you guys can guide a lot and can contribute a lot. Mm -hmm. it takes time, unfortunately. It's often done at night and on the weekends, but it's not a race. And I think, um, you know, unfortunately, an abstract is can can be, you know, small. The whole study doesn't have to be finished by the time an abstract is submitted mm -hmm. and you one can still continue to work. So I would really encourage as many people as possible. Sorry, I'm talking a lot. I see there's quite a, a lot in the chat. Thanks very much, Riley, um, for taking us through a very complicated talk, but being a very systematic and kind of step-by-step -step guide. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people appreciate it. I think it's also very important that you've highlighted that it's really that you need to assess the quality of the papers that you're reading quite critically um, because there is a lot out there and sometimes it's a bit overwhelming the amount of information that you have. Um, so I'll welcome anyone with questions to put them in the chat um, or to put their hands up and we'll unmute you. Thank you, Ashton. I think you're exactly right. And the quality can also be different things, you know, because some people just presume because it comes from somewhere it can't be good quality. That's not true. And for example, there was a systematic review on chronic kidney disease done by North Americans a couple of years ago. And the highest quality papers were actually done by Professor Sumaili from, from Kinshasa. And they were just, they scored high on the international scoring checklists, you know. So that just shows this quality data can come from Africa for sure. So I think the pediatric nephrologists, you know, one of the ways to maybe start is just start thinking, what are you seeing a lot of? What are you struggling with? And I think one other value of publishing is sometimes raising awareness of what one might not have. So one goes to the literature and one sees one treats all the atypical HUS with eculizumab, you know, on a routine basis, let's say in Switzerland. And you, what are you doing, you know? How are you managing without this? And that might help you if you can publish that in your discussion. You can discuss, you know, we don't have eculizumab. This is what we're doing. These are our outcomes. And then you can go to your policymaker and say, it's not right, you know. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's also a value of research is, is, is being able also to highlight what one doesn't have. Sometimes one's embarrassed to say we don't have the high, you know, the, the state of the art, so we can't publish. That's not true. I'm happy to share this presentation. Um, I think more important probably are the, the web web links at the end. Um, but definitely very happy to share the presentation with anybody. And I believe this is going to be on YouTube, but I'm happy to share the PD, the PowerPoint with anybody. It's just um, an apology and then a question. So apologies in my presentation that I left patient Sigwadi off. She's our current South African pediatric nephrologist. Um, chair and so she's also very much part of our team so apologies for that um but a question and it's not there's no pressure but would people be interested in teaming up uh, with mentors and mentees um is that something that people might want to send names to the organizers and possibly team up with people it's not compulsory um and I hope the mentors would have enough time to do that, but it's just a thought. Yes, I, I think this is uh, really um, what we will need to do some uh, advanced uh, <clears throat> literature uh, reviews like uh, the ones suggested by Valerie, because <clears throat> I think that, uh, as I said before, that many of us in Africa don't have the sufficient expertise really to produce such um, highly, uh, you know, um, um, regarded uh, <clears throat> pieces of literature. So we really need to team up with uh, mentors. So, so in, in, in future in future webinars that we're going to have um, along uh, the course of the next uh, few months, 
are we going to discuss you know um, other types of research uh, uh, other types of papers and other types of research uh, other than systematic reviews of course and how to uh, do them properly because we have we have a lot of limitations uh, for research in africa and uh, we want to you know be able to uh, put guidelines or directions for how to overcome these limitations for example we have limitations in um, in, in in designing uh, a, a good study you know to be powerful enough to be uh significant when that when, when, when the results come out you know we don't have i don't i don't think in african countries you have a lot of animal research uh, i don't do you have in, in south africa for example uh, minion do you have animal research that you can uh, uh, do we, we don't have really basic uh, basic science research in many of our african countries and that's why most of the papers that we publish are going to be uh, cross-sectional uh, you know, studies that look at um, patient uh, groups or analysis of patient clinical outcomes and, um, and, and, and ep ep so, sort of epidemiologic studies. So we, we, we want to really see how we can solve the problems that Africa meets in producing uh, different kinds of, um, of, of papers, not just what we are used to producing, you know. I think, you just know, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Some of the future topics do cover study design methodology. Um, and I think that we would go through the different options and things. And and I think this may also be something that eventually continues, you know, but I think for now it would be great. And I think if people have ideas, sometimes, you know, it's just important to think about the study beforehand because to just launch oneself without planning is, is also not good because sometimes one uses time and resources and then the ultimate results are not that usable. So I think that's exactly the whole point here and why Minion is pushing to get this done so early so that people can start thinking. Um, the biggest, biggest thing, and I think that's coming later though, is if you want to start working with clinical data, you have to get ethics right at the beginning. You know, for a systematic literature review or just a literature review, you don't have to get any ethics. But the minute you're going to start to go through patient files or things like that. And so there, if anyone's planning anything clinical whatsoever, the ethics needs to get in very early because that's often also a bit of a stumbling block. Okay, so um, uh, um, can, can we ask uh, Amar or um, uh, Ashton, when is our next webinar, please? Uh, so the next webinar in, in this research series is on yes. the 20th of September. Um, and it's it's basically about a study question, so how to choose a topic or a study question, um, because I think that's probably often the first step in terms of starting research. Um, but I think there would be some fireside SEB webinars between then and now. So um, any other uh, comments or questions? So I think Minyan, somebody said they would be interested to team up with someone, so yeah. how are they going to do that? Or oh, Ashton, actually, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I'm to yes, send your interest to Dr. Lloyd on his email address. I've posted that on the on the chat box. So we'll we'll find a way to connect you to uh, the interested people. Thank you. I see there's a lot of email addresses. Maybe I'll put mine in 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 there as well. But I, I'll probably then get lots. Yeah, we can see if. But otherwise, Hejan, do you have these email addresses of everybody in the chat? Do you have a copy of the chat for some? Is there a way? We do have a copy of the chat, and uh, I will oh, email you the uh, oh. these uh, these email addresses very soon. Yeah, I'll send you then the PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, is it um, okay now to uh, end this wonderful uh, session and thank everybody for their contributions and thank you so much, Valerie, for this excellent uh, review of how uh, you know it's possible and to encourage us Africans to uh, write these uh, systematic reviews and not to be daunted by this task. And I think this is a great encouragement for us. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Minion. Thank you, Ashton. Thank you, uh, uh, everybody, uh, for all your uh, contributions. Thank you, Lloyd, for hosting us. Thank you very much. And on behalf of Dr. Lloyd and uh, Africa Healthcare Network, I would like to thank the International Pediatric Nephrology Association and all of you for taking time out to be with us this evening. Uh, with that, uh, Thanking you all once again, and uh, thank you for your time, and we hope to see you again next week.